So today we're going to look at the 10 worst oil field disasters. So 12 days ago we saw another major incident, this time in the Gulf of Mexico in, in Mexican uh, territorial waters. And this was Pemex platform on fire. By coincidence, it was just 35 years and one day since the Piper Alpha disaster in the North Sea. And we can see in the aftermath of the fire, we can see that uh, the flames have been put out, but this nearby compression platform certainly damaged in the blaze. The rest of the complex was uh, probably protected by the, uh, the walls of water that were put up by the support vessels. But uh, nonetheless, we understand there were three fatalities on the platform. So today is uh, the 6th of July 2023 and 35 years ago today 167 lives were taken on the Piper Alpha platform in the North Sea. Some 61 people survived probably at this memorial service that's going on behind me here in Hazelhead Park in Aberdeen. Some of those survivors are present here to remember those who didn't make it. So today we're going to look at the 10 worst oil field disasters. So first we're going to look at the Inchova platform shown here in this photograph. It was in uh, August 1984 in the Campos Basin offshore Brazil where some 42 fatalities occurred. And this was a, a blowout on the Inchova central production platform. A blowout is a loss of well control. There was also a, a lifeboat mechanical failure. So the chronology of the events, there was a blowout followed by an explosion fire. The lifeboat lowering mechanism failed and the uh, lifeboat suspended vertically and, and then dropped, which, which killed 36 of the occupants. Six other workers died jumping into the sea. In April 1988, there was a second blowout during a platform well workover. All workers were safely evacuated and the fire then went on to burn for a month with excessive damage to the top sides. Two relief wells were drilled in 30 days and controlled the blowout. So this hasn't been a, a lucky platform. Here's the uh, Chinook helicopter and a picture of the, uh, the Brent field back in November 1986 in the UK sector of the North Sea. 45 people lost their lives. Uh, two people survived a helicopter crash. It was uh, ultimately down to a gearbox failure. Uh, on the uh, Chinook helicopter. It was uh, described as a catastrophic forward transmission failure, which desynchronized the tandem rotor blades, causing the blades to collide. The chronology we can read through on the, the next slide, but sadly, this, this uh, aircraft was actually just two and a half miles from landing safely at Sumbra Airport. What's unfortunate is that uh, it was only due to make uh, two platform visits. It ended up making a third, and, and but for that time, it may have got back safely. Anyway, the, uh, the helicopter crashed into the sea and, and sank. It still remains the world's worst civilian helicopter crash. And there's the information about the, the detour, which maybe cost that... Uh, additional flying time which uh, had it been avoided perhaps the accident may not have happened but there we are pause the video and uh, read this this is the account from the captain of the helicopter who was was one of the two people to uh, to actually survive the accident but uh, it is pretty stark content so hopefully that won't upset readers eighth place um well in terms of uh, number of fatalities anyway 53 died on the Kolskaya rig. It was in uh, working in the Sea of Okhotsk. It's uh, off the Russian Far East Coast. It was back in December 2011 and uh, the rig collapsed during a tow. Now, this rig was not meant to uh, be towed in winter and the understanding is that waves, it was a, a very high seas and waves damaged the rig's air tanks there was water ingress. The rig pumps operated at full capacity, but um, they, they couldn't cope with the influx of water. A mayday was sent out, but ultimately the rig collapsed. Now, it was under tow in a fierce storm with five metre seas and 15 metres per second winds, about 200 kilometres east of Sakhalin Island in um, over a thousand foot water depth. Now, the platform manufacturer stipulated towing is prohibited in winter 
in winter seasonal zones. It is Russia's worst oil sector loss. More than, uh, more than half the victims were from the city of Murmansk. The towing vessel rescued 14 from the sea. The Bohai 2 rig, um, back in November 1979, it was in the Gulf of Bohai, which is, um, which is off China. But there were 72 fatalities, only two survivors. Again, the rig sank in bad weather. There were forced 10 winds while uh, under tow. So the chronology waves started washing over the main deck and broke a ventilator pump free. It fell and punctured a one meter hole in the deck. The pump room flooded, causing the rig to settle in the water and it became unstable. High winds and unstable conditions led to the capsize. The, the report uh, after the accident recorded uh, a lack of training in the use of life-saving equipment on board, inadequate training for rescue on the towboats, incorrect stowage of equipment and not following standard towing procedures in bad weather. I think all of these contributed to the high level of fatalities in this particular accident. Next, and in number six, um, 81 fatalities, no survivors on the Glomar Java Sea. It sank at uh, 23.51 hours, so 11, nine minutes to midnight on the 25th of October, 1983. It was a a drill ship that sank in very, very high seas, in fact, in, in typhoon conditions. It was Tropical Storm Lex, and it came in from the east, with winds recorded up to 139 kilometres an hour, about 63 miles south of Hainan Island. Contact was abruptly lost with radio comms, but there were a number of issues with the uh, the radios, and this was uh, with Global Marine's office in Houston. Despite a, an extensive search, no survivors were found. Now, drilling op operations had ceased and the, the riser was on board. There was a 15-degree starboard list developed uh, in the very high seas. And it looks like the, uh, the casing and, and, and the riser that was in the derrick um, was, was being shifted around. Three moorings parted, but uh, that wasn't considered uh, critical. The starboard lifeboat was launched, uh, but it was found empty eight hours uh, later. I believe it was uh, actually found inverted no definitive explanation of why the drill ship capsized there wasn't a uh, support vessel alongside when uh, when the drill ship actually capsized uh, because the the conditions were just so bad the ocean ranger and here's a memorial in st john's in newfoundland in february 1982 the uh, hibernia oil field is where the uh, rig was operating offshore eastern canada 84 fatalities there were no survivors it's a semi-submersible rig and it again capsized during a fierce storm we understand that the the chain locker and upper deck flooded the buoyancy was lost and the rig collapsed the final report cited uh, the very very severe storm weather conditions there were design inadequacies and a lack of knowledge of human intervention cited three salvage workers sadly died in the summer of 1982 and uh, new practices and regulations resulted from this there is a link to a, uh, a video there and uh, highly recommend it's harrowing but uh, but a, a story of what happened to the ocean ranger the seacrest drill ship well this is november 1989 and it was operating in the platong gas field uh, in the south china sea in the thai sector 91 fatalities there were some six survivors and it again a drill ship capsizing during a typhoon the drill ship actually capsized but it stayed afloat for several days it was during typhoon gay which had produced 100 knot winds which is around about 51 meters per second and uh, more than 12 meter high or 40 foot waves hundreds of fishing vessels were also uh, lost during this typhoon so it was a really severe storm the drill pipe was hung off on the lower rams and then the uh, high winds and, and heavy seas increased the drill pipe was then brought into the derrick. There was no support vessel, and the helicopter found the drill ship floating upside down the following day, four miles from the well location. A sad loss of life from a, another capsized drill ship. The Alexander Keeland, in March 1980, in the Ekafis field in the North Sea in the Norwegian sector, 123 fatalities now 89 of the crew on board did survive this one the alexander keeland was a five-legged semi-submersible accommodation platform and it was actually uh, alongside the edda platform the root cause was an undetected fatigue fracture in a weld on an instrument connection on a bracing 
So the crack was probably there from the build. This is indeed where the, the, the crack developed. And uh, I think this is, the, uh, this is the instrument connection here. And the crack developed, and, and this is how the bracing parted. Now, once this one bracing member failed, yeah, it was in uh, only 12 meter high seas. So it wasn't a severe storm, but the other bracings failed in succession. The leg then broke off and uh, there were still four remaining legs and the platform listed to 30 degrees. Then five of the six anchor cables snapped. The The sixth anchor cable actually um, stabilized the platform for a while, but then when it snapped, the uh, platform capsized. So there was 14 minutes between the leg breaking to the capsize. One life raft was launched successfully, but the rest was smashed by waves. Consequent improvements included uh, the command structure. Who orders the abandonment? There was some confusion during this particular disaster. The onload release hooks for, for the life boats, I think, were redesigned, and some improvements were actually put into law in the Norwegian Petroleum Act of 1985. This was a, a program which may be available to uh, to, to see. Um, it's a series, uh, but it actually features uh, Alexander Keeland, and uh, it was it should be available on uh, BBC iPlayer for those who have access to it. It's called State of Happiness. It looks at the development of uh, oil in, in in Norway, in particular in Stavanger, and the finding of the Ekofisk field, which we did a video on uh, previously. Uh, and we'll leave a link to that below. But uh, but also it, it tackles the, uh, the very sad Alexander Keelan disaster. In second place, still ranks as the, the worst offshore disaster, is of course Piper Alpha. As we previously saw, this happened on the 6th of July 1988. It was in the UK sector of the, uh, the North Sea. 167 fatalities. There were many more injured and, uh, and traumatised. Two of the rescuers who actually um, came off one of the support vessels, very brave men. They too were, were sadly perished in the fire underneath the uh, underneath the platform. Root cause? Well, there's been an awful lot written in the uh, Cullen Inquiry. Was it just kind of communication? There was. Uh, it led to a, a transformational change in, in offshore safety. Here's the chronology. I'll leave you to read that. Very sad, uh, sad event. It was a platform that was actually, uh, from, from day one, was really working at a 100% capacity pretty much for the entire time. So it was always really one of the most stressed platforms in the, in the North Sea in, in, in the fact that um, it was really operating you know, at, its, uh, at its limit throughout its field life. Chronology, described as being highly probable, it's based on eyewitness reports of survivors. Now, the worst disaster in the history of oil and gas occurred in China onshore, and it was back in December of uh, 2003, and it was in the Changdong Bai gas field in China. There, there were 243 fatalities. 9,000 people were injured, and over 41,000 people were evacuated. And the root cause? Well, it was the blowout of a well. A lot of it was to do with victims inhaling toxic H2S. We did a video previously on uh, hydrogen sulfide, and it's available on the channel. We'll put a link below. And you can see that uh, the hydrogen sulfide is, is a very, very toxic and poisonous gas. Now, the chronology, well, we'll look on the next slide, but it was the number 16 well. It was a known sort of um, sour gas field, and this well had a blowout. The rescue teams, because it was in a rem remote mountainous area, but they couldn't actually reach the area for 48 hours. And there was a lack of um, appropriate uh, safety equipment, uh, breathing apparatus. The uh, The cloud of gas affected a, an area of 25 square kilometres. And many were overcome with the fumes whilst they slept. Others died trying to evacuate the area. Local hospitals were overwhelmed with thousands injured. Some of them were critical. The threat was well known, but there was no emergency evacuation plan. Apparently, there was no safety monitoring equipment or alarm system. If we look, this is the uh, the trove entry for this particular incident. And you can see uh, lots more detail available for this. But uh, this is a, a diagram that kind of shows the well took a kick. Um, eventually, the, uh, the gas started to come out and a big cloud actually came down the hillside into a local village. Now, hydrogen sulfide is, is uh, more dense than air, so it, it will fall. It spread over a very wide area. So what have we looked at so far? Well, we've looked at 10 
of the worst disasters in the oil and gas sector. If we look at them and add up all the fatalities there's been, it's almost a thousand people lost in just these 10 accidents. So what has been learned from these and another uh, major offshore accidents in the oil and gas sector? Well, this publication down here, here's, the, uh, here's a reference. This study looked at the, uh, the frequency for each and each of these. And you can study this uh, by pausing the video. But uh, the two I would uh, draw attention to are procedural failures, 42%, and control system failures. Now, what are these? Procedures not followed or incompatible ineffective command structure, weather warnings, contingency plans. So very much uh, humans and uh, also uh, down here, control system failures, loss of well control, safety critical equipment, and maintenance faults. These are the two areas, but you know there are significant others. My good friend, Alan Holmes, he's been assessing the root cause of, of many of the uh, major oil and gas accidents worldwide and Alan's got a, a wealth of knowledge and experience of, of many of the major incidents that have taken place. And that's a contact for him. So uh, please uh, get in touch if you'd like to find out more from, from Alan. As mentioned earlier, we actually have a database, uh, part of our Trove databases. And this one's on uh, HSE, Health and Safety and Environment. And uh, you can see uh, this is uh, lots of information here. We've got about 118 of the major oil and gas incidents uh, currently itemized. We are looking for somebody to actually help us to populate this and actually take it on to a, a higher level um, to develop it and, and aid the understanding and hopefully raise awareness of, of oil field safety. We intend to make this uh, database available online uh, on a not-for-profit basis uh, to safety-related bodies. So if anybody is interested, please uh, get in touch or if you're uh, indeed interested in sponsoring this effort again please get in touch there's the email address thanks once again for watching please subscribe to our channel we do need your support give us a thumbs up if you thought that this was an informative video and ring the bell if you'd like to be informed when we come out with new material there's my email address and there's the company website if you'd like to have a look and find out more about the company thanks very much for watching hope to see you back on our channel before too long. Bye for now.